Okay, so in this video, we're going to take a look at adding vectors. And we're going to start off with something we've met before, which is adding vectors in one dimension, which we've looked at before when we're looking at forces. So just to illustrate what I'm talking about here, um, some examples would be something like this. So we've got an object. So the first one, we've got a 20 Newton force acting to the right, a 5 Newton one acting to the left. So if we wanted to calculate the resultant force, we would do 20 minus 5 because they're acting in opposite directions, giving you a resultant force of 15 Newtons to the right. We can do the same thing with this bottom one, but they're both in the same direction. So we get a resultant force of 40 Newtons to the right. So if you've not seen it before, this is the symbol that we use for resultant force. So it's a Greek sig capital sigma letter, which in mathematics means sum of. So resultant force literally means sum of the forces. OK, so that's what we've met before. OK, so first question to ask ourselves is what is a vector? Well, a vector is a quantity, so something that we can measure, that has both magnitude and direction. So there's another type of quantity, something, uh, it's another type of thing a quantity can be, it's called a scalar, and those only have magnitude. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. So what are some examples that we've met before that fit into each category? So a scalar we've met before would be energy, distance, speed. So those are all things we've met before. Those are all what we call scalars. So we just give them a size. So when we talk about energy, we say it has 200 joules of energy. We don't say anything to do with you don't have 200 joules upwards or anything like that. Vectors would have a size and direction. So we have a force that's 20 newtons to the right, acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared downwards, velocity, I don't know, upwards and to the left of 20 meters per second. So they've got a direction that comes with them. So Let's actually take a look at why it's important whether an object is or quantity is a scalar or a vector. So if you're doing a calculation with vectors, your final answer should have both a magnitude and a direction, or at least some way of indicating direction on it. So that's the first thing. When we're doing calculations, vectors should have directions too. Um, so what does that look like? So a very basic calculation like the ones we've seen before. So here, resultant force is 15 newtons. And then we can see we've got this to the right. So we're indicating the direction that it's going. Sometimes we use uh, positive and negative signs to do this for us. Um, but we need a size and a direction when we're giving a vector. So we have to know what the vectors are. And so then we know to give a direction with them. The other thing is that when we're combining vectors together, like we have been with the forces, they work different mathematically to scalars. And I'll illustrate how that works now. So if we want to combine sc scalars together, so if an object travels 20 meters and then travels 15 meters, it has traveled a total distance of 25 meters. There is no other distance that we could say it's traveled. Okay? There's a definitive answer of 25. Same thing with energy. If you have 200 joules of kinetic energy and it's given 300 joules more, it now has 500 joules of kinetic energy. Okay. Again, that's fairly intuitive and that's basically what we've met so far. In almost all scenarios, we've been talking about scalars so far in physics. Let's look at vectors. So if an object has a 20 Newton force applied and also a 10 Newton force, if force was a scalar, we would say the total force is 30 Newtons. But it isn't necessarily, and we can look at an example of where it isn't. So here we've got a 20 Newton force and a 10 Newton force. And you can see that they actually when we add those together, we get a 10 Newton force to the right. We don't get 30 Newtons. So that's an example of how a vector is different to a scalar. If force had been a scalar, it would have been 30 and it would always be 30. So that's, that's one thing there. So now we sort of seen when we how we can't add vectors let's look at how we actually do add them so since vectors have magnitude and direction we're representing them using arrows and that's what you're seeing me do on the force diagrams you're actually seeing me drawing the force vector arrows there if we want to add them we have to put the vectors tip to tail and i'll show you what that means in a second but that's something we have to remember we have put the vector arrows tip to tail 
and then to find the resultant of those vectors, we determine the vector that goes from the start of the first vector, so the tail of the first vector, to the end of the final vector. Now that all is gibberish at the moment because we haven't seen it in action, but these are our rules for adding vectors. We represent them as arrows, put them tip to the tail, and go from the start of the first one to the end of the final one. That would be our resultant or our sum. So let's have so we'll look at a simple example first, adding perpendicular vectors. OK, so let's say we have an object and there's a 30 Newton force downwards and a 40 Newton force to the right. So those are at 90 degrees. So we've got perpendicular vectors. So we've represented those forces using arrows. That's what you're seeing on the diagram. I probably should have made that 40 Newton one a bit longer. So it's clearly longer than 30, but that doesn't matter for now. So what we need to do is our next rule was we add them tip to tail. So there's two ways we could do that. We could do the 40 Newton force first, followed by the 30 Newton, or we could do the 30 Newton followed by the 40 Newton. But the key is that the tip of the 40 Newton is where the tail of the 30 starts. So you can see we've gone, the arrows essentially are all following on from one another, producing one continuous vector, if you like. Then what we do is we draw from the start of the first one to the end of the last one. So that's what we've done here. So our resultant goes from the tail of the 40 Newton vector to the tip of the 30 Newton, or on this diagram down here, the tail of the 30 to the tip of the 40. Essentially going from start to finish. And now what we can do is actually think about calculating what that resultant is. And the key is the fact that these are right angle triangles, which means we can use Pythagoras theorem. So Pythagoras theorem would say that for either of these two triangles, the resultant squared is 40 squared plus 30 squared, which is 2,500 Newton squared when we add them together. So when we square root that, we can get a resultant of 50 Newtons. And this is what happens when we add 40 Newtons to 30 Newtons when they're at 90 degrees to one another. Now, a few of you at this point uh, should be picking up the fact that I earlier told you that force is a vector. And I said when we give answers to calculations with vectors, they should have direction as well. And I clearly haven't given a direction here. So the reason I haven't is because we're starting to go beyond the scope of the course here. But I do want to show you how you do. Uh, those of you who are interested know but we have now gone beyond what would be uh, in the normal specification here. So we can find the direction of R by I'm going to find this angle in here, theta. Now, I could have picked the other angle if I'd wanted to. There's no problem with that. But I just picked this one. So if we want to find this, we can use trigonometry to find it. So we know that tan theta is the side opposite to the angle divided by the side adjacent to the angle. So the side opposite is 30 newtons and the side adjacent to it is 40. So that's why we get tan theta is equal to three quarters. And if we use the inverse tan function, we find out theta is equal to 37 degrees. And therefore, to give a proper answer to the previous question, the resultant force is 50 newtons, 37 degrees below the horizontal to the right. So now we've got a complete vector description of the resultant force there. Um, but most of the time, or in fact, all of the time in this course, if you're asked to calculate the resultant, it will say calculate the magnitude of the resultant specifically because it doesn't want you to worry about figuring out this angle here. OK, so that's adding perpendicular vectors in 2D. What are not perpendicular? OK, so let's say we have this set up you can see here. Um, so. We've got a 50 Newton force at 10 degrees to the vertical and a 100 Newton force at 30 degrees to the vertical. So those aren't perpendicular, so we can't just use Pythagoras theorem here. So how do we approach it? Well, we're going to draw a scale diagram to add these vectors. So what we're going to do is we're going to represent 50 Newtons using a length and we're going to represent 100 Newtons using something which is double that length. But those lengths are going to be using those same angles there. Here is a representation of what you can see here. So I'm still following the same rules we used before. So we add the vectors tip to tail. So if you actually look here, I've put the 50 Newton force first, followed by the 100 Newton force. So we've got them tip to tail. We've got the resultant going from start to finish. 
So we're using the same rules as before. Now I've used a scale of, as you can see up on here, I've used a scale of one centimeter is 10 newtons. So this all here is what we call our scale. So that means the 50 newton force is represented by a five centimeter long line, uh, which you can see there. I can terribly underlined, but uh, we can see there got a five centimeter long line and our 100 newton force is represented by a 10 centimeter line but the angles are kept the same so you can see i've drawn myself a dotted li dashed line in here which is our vertical line and the five centimeter line was 10 degrees to the left of this line so i measured that using a protractor so essentially what i did is i put my protractor at the bottom here and then I marked where 10 degrees was on my protractor. And then I drew a line which was five centimeters long in this direction here. Then I did the same thing. I put my protractor here. I marked where 30 degrees was on my protractor. And then I drew a line 10 centimeters in the direction of that line. And once I have then done that, I was then in a position to draw my resultant. I used a ruler to measure how long the resultant was use the scale to find out what that was actually in newtons, so 144 newtons. And then with a protractor, I was able to measure what this angle in here is theta there. So that's how I was able to measure that, by just using a protractor. Okay, so that's how we can add forces together using scale diagrams. So a few of you at this point must be asking, well, surely there's a better way of adding vectors together. and there is, but again, like before, not part of the course. But I do want to show you what that looks like as well, so you can see where this goes. So we're going to use a technique called resolving, which is essentially the opposite of the process I've been showing you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of those two force vectors and split them into two components. So I'm taking two vectors and I'm producing four but those four vectors will have the same effect as those two vectors. That's what resolving really means. So this 50 Newton one, I'm going to split into a vertical one and a horizontal one to the left. The 100 Newton one, I'll split into a vertical one and a horizontal force to the right. And I'm going to use trigonometry to work out the magnitude of these four vectors. So let's do it for the blue, first of all. So I've marked our side opposite and our side adjacent, so you know what they're referring to. So sine 10 is going to be opposite over hypotenuse, cos 10 is going to be adjacent over hypotenuse, and therefore I can find out what the opposite and the adjacent are by rearranging that expression. So you can see uh, the horizontal component to the left is 8.68, the vertical component upwards is 49.24, and we can do the same other one. So again, I'm marking my opposite and adjacent side in there, um, and then rearranging those expressions to calculate what the opposite and adjacent forces are. So this time we've got upward and to the right. So now I've calculated these four vectors, I can redraw this diagram we can see on the left into something that's easier to work with. This is what this now looks like. So these are the two upward components. So this is We've got the upward component of the 50 newton force, the upward component of the 100 newton force. We've got the compo horizontal component to the right of the 100 newton force and the horizontal component to the left of the 50 newton force. This is what we've got here. And we can simplify this diagram further. So we can represent it like this. So the two upward forces are in the same direction, so we add them together. The 50 and the 8.62 are in opposite directions, so we cancel those out like so. Can do now is follow our rules of vector addition. So we can add them tip to tail. So I did the horizontal one and then the vertical one. We can then, because we formed a right angle triangle now, we can use Pythagoras to calculate what our resultant is. And you can see it comes out as 142. Uh, with the scale diagram, I think I got 144. So you can see we've got pretty good agreement between our answers. And we can also use trigonometry to figure out what this angle in here is. Um, and for those of you wondering why the angle has come out different to when we use a scale diagram, in the scale diagram, I worked out that this angle in here was 17 degrees. This one is 73. And when we add those two together, they get 90. So that looks good as well. Um, so this is how it's 
done in reality later on uh, once you move on to sort of a level or pre u whatever kind of physics you may want to go on to um, but i just wanted to show that for those of you who are interested in seeing how this is actually done because uh, drawing scale diagrams gets a bit fiddly and annoying the more vectors you're trying to add together Okay, so final thing to ask yourself, because I've gone into a few extra details on quite a few different things there. So the key things I'd like you to take away, uh, do you know how to add one dimensional vectors? Uh, that's something we went before and recapped at the start. Can you describe how vectors are different to scalars? Can you describe the rules for vector addition? Can you describe how to add 2D vectors that are perpendicular? And can you describe how to add 2D vectors in your scale diagram? Those are the key things I want you to take away. And there were a few extension things for those of you who are a bit interested as well.